Hello, and welcome to Getting Started with Perception ePower Session 2. I'm Krista Tweed, an Applications Engineer with HBK. In Session 1, we discussed how to configure the different components in the ePower Suite page and set up your hardware measurements. Now we will look at what perception sets up automatically in the background based on all of the power measurements that you requested. I want to take a quick look here at the optional analysis button in the control panel of the ePower suite. We turn all of these optional analysis items on by default, but if some of them you're not interested in those calculations, you can easily disable those. So the optional analysis includes calculating the fundamentals of both voltages and currents, calculating the angle between the different phases of a three-phase measurement, and creating phasors of the fundamental, and also calculating space vectors. If any of these are not of interest to you, simply click the box to unselect them. You can save that as a preference so that every new workbench you start from scratch in the future would also not automatically configure that measurement. Or you can do it just for a single setup time. So now let's go look at where all of these real-time calculations are happening. Those calculations take place on a DSP, a digital signal processor, that is on each power module in the GenDAC Power Analyzer. And we can find those formulas that are being calculated in the settings sheet because they take place on the hardware. Now, in your version of Perception, if you do not see the settings sheet at the top of your screen, then go to the Sheets menu. You would click on Settings to have it be displayed. Sometimes it is just hidden. If you don't see settings in the list at all, click the Manage Sheets button, and then Find Settings in the List, and you will click Load. And then I would recommend changing the default to either Hide or Show, depending on your preference. In the Settings sheet, we're going to come down to the Real-Time Data box and click on Formula Database. Now, everything you're seeing here are formulas that we created automatically based on the power measurements that you requested in the ePower suite. One advantage of our system is that we are not a black box. We're never just going to show you a power number and not give you any way to know where that came from. And having this database accessible and viewable is part of that. So you can always come in and look at the formulas and see how the calculations are being done. The green lines are comments. Lines that have both a name and an expression are formulas. So those are then signals that become part of the recorded data file. So let's look at our power calculations. First, we start with the, with the DC block, so the DC power source. We're assigning variable names to the channels making the measurement. So here you can see power source dot out dot I. If you don't like that power source name, you can change it. If we go back to the ePower suite and I click on the power source component and look at the setup dialog, you can see the name you can enter and the output connector also has a name that you can enter whatever you would like it to be. So if you prefer to set up a different name than our defaults, you are welcome to change those. So we just do a, a variable allocation. The cycle master of our DC source is tied to the cycle master of our inverter. So that's what that line is doing. And you can see the cycle check and the frequency of the cycle check formulas as I discussed in session one. Next up, we compute the RMS and the mean values for the DC voltage and current. Whenever you see a capital I or U, 
in perception, that's an RMS, uh, cycle-based RMS calculation. The lowercase i and u are always the raw data. So up here you'll see a lowercase i and u for the measured signal, and then we have a capital I and U for the cycle-based RMS. And then we also calculate the cycle-based mean from those measurements. The power of a DC source is just multiplying the voltage times the current, and we find the mean of that over the cycle. For a three-phase measurement, there's a lot more calculations that are set up automatically. So we again have our variable allocation, and these names, again, you can change based on how you set up the components in the ePower suite. This section here with the cycle parameters is all of the cycle detect calculations. So we're taking the information that you entered in the setup panel, converting it into variables, and using it to create the cycle detection. For the power computations, we first find the RMS of the voltage and current, both per phase and cumulative. To calculate power, we're gonna multiply the individual phases, U1 times I1 to get the phase of power or the power of phase one. Do that for the individual phases and find the total instantaneous power by summing all the three phases together. Then we also find the cycle-based mean of each of those. This is a waveform. So this then would be an, an individual result per cycle of each of those individual phases and sum together to find the total active power. Apparent power is calculated from the RMS of voltage times the RMS of current. We do that for each individual phase and calculate the sum for the total apparent power. And then reactive power is being calculated from the apparent power and the active power. So we square the apparent power, subtract the square of the active power, and take the square root. Do that for each individual phase and sum them up to find the total reactive power. Power factor lambda is the active power divided by the apparent power. And again, we find it per phase and total. The next reason, region is related to that phi and cosine phi measurements and finding the fundamentals of, of both the currents and the voltages. So that's all those formulas. And then we have the space vectors. So we find I alpha and I beta. Next, we come to the motor component and the calculation of mechanical power. In this case, I'm measuring torque and speed based on digital inputs. That's most common for our users who have HBM torque transducers. Since we recommend the most accurate way to get a good torque and speed measurement with an HBM torque transducer and the GenDAC power analyzer is using those digital outputs. So we have our variable allocation. There's the, the torque signal coming from the timer counter channel and the angle measurement coming out of the timer counter channel. We also have our three encoder pulses, we have an ABZ quadrature encoder. So you've got your two pulses and your reference pulse. And then we also have our raw torque train or raw pulse train coming out of our torque sensor. You might remember in this case, I'm using a T40B torque transducer from HBM with a center frequency of 60 kilohertz. That means the center frequency when the torque sensor is at zero torque, I'm seeing a 60 kilohertz pulse train. When I'm at maximum positive torque, I'm at 90 kilohertz. And at maximum negative torque, I'm at 30 kilohertz. So what the timer counter channel of the power analyzer does is for a specified window, 
which the user sets, it's going to watch that pulse train and determine a frequency and then convert that frequency into the specified torque. We again have our cycle master of the torque tied to the inverter. We always on the torque side create two different cycle masters. So we would like to know what the torque is over the electrical, the electrical cycle for the purposes of an efficiency calculation. But there's also a lot of really interesting things typically going on with the torque signal that happen on a much faster time scale than the electrical cycle. And so we create a second cycle master, which we call the instantaneous cycle master for torque and speed, that is just a timed cycle of one millisecond. So every one millisecond, we're going to determine the torque and the speed and give you those results. And those variables are M instantaneous and N instantaneous. When you see M torque and N speed without anything after it, that's over the electrical cycle and the instantaneous is over that one milliseconds. Then the mechanical power is 2 pi m torque times the speed divided by 60. In each efficiency calculation section, you have a variable allocation for the input power of that efficiency and the output. We take the ratio of the two and multiply by 100 to find the efficiency percentage. And we take the difference between the two to find the power loss. And because we had three efficiencies, we'll have three of those sections. Now at the end, you'll see a note that the automatic created formulas are finished. And below this line, you can add your own formulas. We do that because if you go back and change some of your hardware configuration, we're going to adjust the formulas accordingly. And we don't want you to have made changes or added additional formulas in the middle that then get disturbed by us making changes. So it's always here at the bottom that this is where the user has access to enter additional formulas of interest to them. Maybe you want to do a DQ0 calculation. Maybe you have some specific harmonics you'd like to investigate. But you can create those formulas here. Now I'd like to also take a moment and just talk a little bit about post-process formulas. Everything we've been discussing so far, these real-time formulas, happen on the hardware. So you can see the results of those formulas when the system's in preview mode or while you're recording. And all the results become part of your recording file. But in addition, perception can support what we call post-process formulas, calculations being done on data that's already been saved as part of the file. That gets done through this formula database. Now, if, again, if you don't see the formula database in your perception, go to the Sheets menu and look for formula and just click on it to, sheet, to see it, to unhide it. If you don't see it in the list, go to Manage Sheets and just load that sheet. Now, in order, the easiest way to create the post-process formulas is to go to the ePower Suite control panel, and there's a button that says Review Formulas. If I click that button, Perception warns me that everything in the formula sheet will be overwritten. I'm going to say OK, because I don't have anything there anyway. And now if I go to the formula sheet, what I can see is that Perception has recreated all of my real-time formulas for post-process calculations. The reason this can be useful is that, let's say, something unexpected happens in your test and the cycle detect stopped working for the last 30 seconds or something then you could go in, because if you save the raw data, you have all of the raw data, you can go into these post-process formulas, adjust how the cycle detection is being done, and then see what those power results are. You don't have to redo the test. 
In addition, you could come in here and change the number of cycles used for the calculations. Maybe you originally had it set to 10, and you want to see how your results differ if you change that to 5 or 20. So it gives you a lot of flexibility, and having perception automatically create those formulas for you so that they're just part of your virtual workbench and they're always there can save you a lot of work later. So now that you've got all that done, you would then either go to the icon or the file menu and save your virtual workbench with those updates. And now we've reached the end of session two.